do his, um, his testimony this, uh, this afternoon, if they're going to be here. Um, I want to go right into the sermon off of that, um, off of what they just did right there. And I think this will be a help. And uh, if we can just go ahead and get right into that. So if you could turn your Bibles to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. I'm going to preach through two Psalms. I know right now some of you are sweating. Until you get there and you realize they aren't very long. Psalm uh, 42 and 43. And, um, and I, the reason why I just wanted to go right into it is because in this psalm it talks about, and I don't tell anybody what to sing. Um, there is somebody that's in charge of the singing, and which helps me a great deal. I don't have to be in charge of the singing. And, um, and so when they did it, their singing is, then sings my soul. It's a soul that is singing. And, uh, and so in, this, in this, uh, this, this sermon that I'm going to do, it talks about a singing soul. And, um, and then it also, with everything being about Jesus today, I was thinking about the verse in Hebrews um, chapter number, I believe it's 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, um, who endured such contradiction of sinners. All the things you have to go through in life, how do you get through the difficulties of life? In that section, he's telling you, you're going to have to be looking to Jesus, the author who started my faith and who's going to finish my faith in the midst of difficulties. And so um, I want to do that. This, I was reading through this yesterday morning in our Bible reading, Psalm uh, 42 and Psalm 43. And as I was reading through this, some, uh, some, a few words kind of arrested my attention. I got uh, set on them. And then the rest of the day, meditating on them and thinking through them, and by the time the day was over, uh, a sermon kind of came out of it. And so that's when I preach to you uh, this morning. Hopefully it'll be a help to you. In Psalm 42, um, this is a, uh, a psalm that was written, a song that was written. It was given to the chief musician, the sons of Korah, the, some of the people that would be involved in the ministering and the music. And we don't know who wrote it specifically. A lot of people think it's David. I probably think it is David. I think a lot of them say David wrote it. I think some of the other ones that don't say anything, maybe it's David as well. Um, and this David, this definitely fits a time in David's life that I could, I could relate it to. And uh, so hopefully this will be a help to you as well. When we read through it, look at verse number one. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I had went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. And then he says this, and he says this about three times in, this, in these, two, these two psalms, I'm going to read it to you, and it's what he says. He kind of, in the midst of what he's saying, he kind of interjects there, and that's why I called this sermon Preaching to Yourself. Because I can't go home with you uh, to, this afternoon. I can't be with you tomorrow morning when you get up. I can't be with you throughout the week when you hit difficult times. But I can. we can give you the Word of God so that you can then preach this sermon to yourself over and over and over again. And I'm going to tell you, I've had to preach these types of things to myself over and over again in my life. And I think if you'd be honest, some of you have had to preach things to yourself to get yourself self through some difficult times. So he interjects right here in verse 5 and he says this, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Why are you so distressed? Why are you going through so much difficult? Is it difficulty? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? And then he says this, Hope thou in God. Anybody ever done that before? Anybody ever been in something and you're going, Man, why am I so mad? Why am I so irritated? Why am I so distressed? Why am I, am I so cast down in myself? I should be hoping in God. Right? He just interjects himself. Hope thou in God. And he says, For I shall yet praise Him for the... Watch what he says. Help of His countenance. Him looking upon me. Countenance is your face. When the Lord looks upon me and my situation, He's there to help me. And so He's saying to Himself in the midst of all this, 
Why am I cast out? Why am I so distressed? I need to hope in the Lord. I need to look towards Him and praise Him. And then He looks towards me and He helps me as He's looking towards me. That's what He's saying. He's reassuring Himself in the midst of all these things. He says, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember thee from the land of Jordan, of the Hermonites, from the hill of Mizar. Deep calls in the deep, and I'm going to go into that here in just a minute, but that's the words that, that kind of arrested me. And he says, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me, and my prayer unto God of my life. He interjects yet again right in the middle of it and says, I'm just going to focus on His loving kindness. And then he says in verse 9, I will say unto God my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I a mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? They've said that twice. And again, he interjects again, and watch what he says in verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. You ever had to do that multiple times in a day with yourself? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise Him who is the... Now, I, I want to make this the last point, but I want to, it's so good I want to emphasize it right now. He changes the wording up a little bit. Did you notice that? In verse 5, he says, I will yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. He changes it right here. and He says, Hope thou in God, for I shall praise Him who is the health of my countenance and my God. You realize if you can ever get yourself looking towards and focusing on the hope and the help of His countenance, it would change your countenance. There's a whole lot in that. Psalm 43. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust men. For Thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning uh, because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill, to thy tabernacles. And watch this. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I sing, uh, will, will I praise thee, O God, my God. And he ends it again. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted, disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him who is the health of my countenance and my God. It's interesting when you look at that. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit about Psalm 44 as, as well. These, these psalms are put together, and I've got three, four little points that I want you to get a hold of. And, and I want you to think on this, write this down, make notes with it, because you're going to have to preach this sermon to yourself tomorrow. You're going to have to preach this sermon to yourself, maybe before the day is over today. You'll have to preach this sermon to yourself next week, next month, next year. You'll have to do this. As I was, I was looking at this, Stacy isn't in here, my wife. She's teaching with the kids. And I went over this with her yesterday and I said, here's what I'm getting from what we read this morning together. This is what I've got now. And she said, let me tell you something. That was my life every day for 20 years when we were waiting to have children. I had to do exactly what this psalmist is saying in this. I had to do it over and over and over again. And so I'm just saying to you, no matter what you're going through in life, this is to be something that, watch now, you need to preach to yourself over and over and over again. I think it's interesting that at least four or five times this man stopped in the middle of what he said and said, just kind of shook himself and said, why am I like this? My hope is in God. We've got to do that. I want you to look at a few things with me. And looking at verse number 1-4, through four, when he looks at it, he says there in that first one, it says, As a heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. He says in verse number 2, My soul thirsteth for God. There's a few things I want you to see. The first one is a reoccurring problem. He has a problem. If you watch, if this is David, David writes psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm of going through the exact same things in life, of people chasing him down, of him going through difficulties, of him going through anguish and trouble, and him calling out to the Lord in the midst of all of his troubles. Over and over again, this is a common theme throughout all of David's writings. Let me make a statement. If you were traveling with David, you would see 
the fierce fighter. You would see the confident man that knows exactly what to do at any time. You would see a, a confident leader in everything you did with him. You would see that. But I'm telling you that in the quiet times when David would pin stuff down and write songs, you see a deeper part of his heart. In front of people, it may have been a very confident individual, but by himself, he's crying out, God, where are you at in the midst of my difficulties? And let me say this. Some of you may feel like that sometimes. That everybody sees on the outward. I know this is true for me. This is a true psalm for me. On the outward, listen, you can't come in. You can be down as a pastor, but you've got to at least look like you're, you're all put together when you get in this spot. You say, well, that's fake. Yeah, well, some people just don't have the tolerance to let you just be whatever you want to be in transparent in the pulpit. But I'm going to tell you something. There are difficulties that we face just like anybody else faces. Leaders, David faces difficulties, and maybe it would not be good for his men to see him uh, in a cave writing a song about, God, where in the world are you at in the midst of my trouble? But that's how he felt, according to the Bible. And some of you can maybe relate to that. My soul is thirsting. I'm panting after it. In verse number 4, he says, I'm pouring out my soul in me. His reoccurring problem. His desire to be around the Lord. I, I, I found something else that's interesting. You look at verse number 2. He says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I, I think this is probably, possibly, when David has been a running from either Saul or running from his son Absalom, when he's having to be displaced from where he's at, and he's a little bit distant, maybe, from the place where he was last with God. That'll make sense to some of you. He's a little bit distant. In verse number 4, watch what he says. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had, I underlined that, I had. Not I am now or I'm going to go do it tomorrow. I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy days. He's saying, he's thinking back and remembering, I have been in a place that was very safe, very secure, where I was praising God and I was with a bunch of other people that loved God and loved the right things. And now I'm not in that place geographically. I'm not there. And tomorrow, or maybe when you're at your job site, or maybe when you get some bad news, you can remember back. I remember when things were really good and I was standing in the choir and I was lifting up my hands, crying, praising God. I remember those days when I'm there. But right now, in this day, wherever I'm at, I'm having to preach to myself because I'm not in the multitude. I'm not in the holy day. I'm not in the tabernacle. I'm somewhere else a little bit distant from where I used to be. Now, at least a couple of you are saying, yeah, because a couple of you relate. Maybe some of you are thinking. I'm telling you, there's a lot of us that we can remember being very close to the Lord, but there's times, you know, it's easy to, set, it's easy to shout amen when you're in a church service and everything's going good. But when the phone rings and it's disturbing, or you're not sure where the next paycheck's coming from, or things are getting difficult, you can remember back to when you shouted in the congregation. You can remember back when you were singing praises about how good Jesus was. But listen now, it's in those days you're going to have to preach to yourself that God is still good. It's in those days you're going to have to do exactly what this psalmist is doing. His desire to be close to the Lord. I, I, my soul's panting after you. His distance, maybe he's from them. His distress, when you look at it, uh, and all the things he's talking about there, look at verse number, uh, verse number 3. My tears have been my meat day and night. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I can't even eat. I don't know if anybody's ever been in a spot where you've been so distressed that you can't even eat. You know what he's feasting off of? His tears day and night. That's all he has the strength to do. He has even the strength to eat. He's just living off of his tears. Maybe uh, he's, he's got no appetite. He's, he's, uh, he's just crying instead of eating. And there he is, and there's people around him. While he's in that difficulty, there's some good folks around him that are encouraging him. No, there's people around him saying, where is thy God? Adding insult to injury. 
You might, not, you might not have an actual person that comes around and says, hey, where's your God in the midst of what you're going through? But when you're going through a difficult time, you're not even sleeping at night, you're going through some kind of difficulty, and you turn on the TV set or you look at an app, and in it, they're saying, without saying directly to you, but they're saying in this ungodly nation that he's talking about and that we can relate to, they're saying, hey, where's your God, people of God? You're being bombarded from all angles in distress. They said, where's your God? They asked him again. Look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 9. I will say unto God, my rock. Listen now. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I in mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? There's an enemy that's oppressing me. He says, as with a sword in my bones, there's something aching deep down in me. You say, what, a, what an encouraging message. Well, it'll get better in a minute. Mine enemies reproach me while they say daily, Daily unto me, where is thy God? In verse number 1 of chapter 43, he says, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. I'm telling you, our nation is getting more ungodly every half second, it seems like. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust men. In verse number 2, he says, Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Listen, he's under oppression from individuals. He's under the oppression of a nation that's not walking the way it's supposed to be. And I think we can all relate. His reoccurring problem and his discouragement is, he says, I pour out my soul within me. I want you to see, secondly, look at verse number 6. He says this, he changes, he's been talking about himself, now he's going to start talking to God. And so the next thing I want you to see is his real prayer. His real prayer. And I, I titled his real prayer because there is a realness to this prayer that most people don't dare to pray. Look at verse number 6. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. He says this, Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and the Hermonites, from the hill of Miser. Watch this now, verse 7. Deep calleth unto deep. I don't know how many people I've talked to in the past, and I've done this myself. When you're in a deep place or a dark place, I promise you the end will be better than the beginning. When you get to a dark place and a deep place, I, I guarantee you some of you can say amen to this. You get to a place where you're in the depths, in darkness, and you start focusing so much on the deep that you actually spiral a little deeper. Some of you would say, I've never experienced this before. I pray you never do. But you can get to a place that you get so focused on the deep, on the dark, that you actually go a little bit darker. You, you go a little bit deeper. Instead of looking towards, and I'm going to show you in a minute, looking towards light and looking up, you're saying, I am so, he's talking about overwhelmed, the waves are overflowing. I feel so deep, so down, that when I start thinking about life, I don't think about the goodness, I don't think about anything else. I start thinking about how bad it is, which makes it even worse. You're saying, why are you preach this? Well, I'm, I'm trying to help you see that the way you feel today is the way at least this psalmist felt when he wrote it. You don't have to feel like the Lone Ranger. Tonto wrote the same thing in this one here. His real prayer. The depths of where I'm at. Watch what he says, at the noise of what? Not their water spouts of thy. You know what he, he almost, now I'm telling you, that's why I called it a real prayer, is because most of us would not have the boldness. And I think we, we can take a lesson from here is that you can talk to God like you would talk to your father. And you can just say, I don't get it. I don't understand. Several times David would say, how long, O Lord? What, how long until you're going to figure this? How long until you're going to avenge me? How long until you set things right? He's saying this, I'm in the deep. All I can hear is the noise of the things that you could be delivering me from, but you don't seem to be delivering from them right now. How many can agree with that? It's just like when the, the men in the ship said, uh, woke up, Jesus said, Carest not thou that we perish? The waves are crashing in. We feel like we're going under. And these under this Noise in verse number 9, 10. Watch what it says. 9 and 10. I will say unto God, my rock. I'm going to speak to him. Why hast thou forgotten me? Anybody ever felt like that before? I feel like God's forgotten me. Stacy used to say to me 
when we were going through some of the difficulties we've gone through in life and her medical issues, she would say this, I think that God tolerates me and He loves you. You say, well, that's, why would somebody think that? Because that's where your mind gets. And I think the only reason why God blesses us as a family is because of you, and I'm just along for the ride. I'm like a, a, a something that God just kind of a, tolerates. You can forget that. You can, I mean, you can feel like that. You can say, God, why hast thou forgotten me? Look at verse number 2 of 43. For thou art the God of my streak. Why dost thou cast me off? That's a very real prayer. I mean, I, I'm telling you, you can be very real with God. I think Miss, when Miss Hooker was here for the ladies' conference, I think she talked a little bit about that. But you know you can be very real with God. Listen, He already knows what's in your mind and what's in your heart. Why don't you start just communicating that with Him? Why don't you start just talking with God? Sometimes we think that I come to God and say, Oh, Father that art in heaven, You are the Lord above all lords. You are the King above all kings. Listen, you can say all that if you want to, but I would rather just get down and say, God, I, you know what's going on in me. I know where you're at. I know that you're there. You are my hope. You are my strength. You are everything to me. But right now, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel very close. I feel very distant. I remember being in the sanctuary. I remember shouting amen there. But today, where I'm standing right now, I feel a little bit forgotten. I feel a little bit cast off. Anybody ever get that way with God? Why not just talk to God like a real person, talking to a real father, his real prayer. But here's where the, the sermon starts to change for you. And I want you to see this, his reasonable perspective. You know, I, I titled it reasonable perspective because I'm going to tell you something that I've found to be true about me and about people that I've counseled. When you're in distress, you stop thinking reasonably. You start getting unreasonable. Things aren't moving fast enough. This is going to be terrible. People start talking in absolutes like nothing is ever going to be right again. No, it, yes. Next week, it's going to be, listen, tomorrow the mercies are new every day. Tomorrow's going to be a new day. Don't cash in everything just because today seems bad. Just wait a little while. Sometimes things get better down the road. But people get unreasonable. So his reasonable perspective. In verse number 5, he says, "Thou, Why art thou cast out on my soul? And this is what I'm talking about, about preaching to yourself. You may have to, in the midst of your problems, in the midst of your prayer, you may have to just interject and say, Why am I cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? He says this, Hope thou in God. You know what? That's what we've got to do. We've got to start looking for His help. Verse number 5, his hope, my hope is in Him. My help comes from Him. That's what verse number 5 says. Look at verse number 8. Watch what it says. Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness. You know what loving kindness is? Loving kindness, when the Bible talks about loving kindness, it's God's kindness and steadfast love towards His children. You know what He's trying to get Himself to focus on? I wish you'd get this this morning. He's trying to get Himself to look towards the face of God, to look for Him for His help, to look for Him for His hope, and He's trusting in the loving kindness that the Father shows all of His children. Amen. He's trying to get His focus in the right place. The loving kindness, when you go through in tons of the Psalms, talk about the loving kindness of God. It talks about His love, His steadfast love, and His kindness as He meets our needs. Delivering us from evils. Delivering us from distresses. That's who He is. And then in verse number 11, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance, and my God. You know what you have to do? Listen now, let me tell you this. Sometimes in the midst of difficulties, and I'm preaching to myself too a little bit, you have to take yourself in hand, you have to shake yourself, maybe slap yourself a little bit, and you have to preach to yourself. You may have to question yourself. Why am I acting like this? What have I, why am I losing hope? Why am I looking at the situation 
instead of looking at the countenance of God? Why am I looking at the difficulties instead of turning my eyes to Jesus? Why am I forgetting? Why am I remembering being... Listen, why am I thinking I can only be right with God if I'm in a geographic location, standing, singing songs here? Why am I thinking that's the only time I can feel the, the, the peace and the hope and the help of God is when I'm standing in a choir? Because I'm going to tell you something, geography doesn't dictate how close you can be to God. You can be close to God in your living room. You can be close to God in your car. You can be close to God in the doctor's office. It's not a matter of where I'm standing. He said, I can remember being in that sanctuary, but it's not a matter of being in a geographic place. It's a matter of your perspective and your heart. And so he's trying to remind himself of where his hope and his help comes from. You realize one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 5, verse number 2. It says this, By whom also we have access by faith into His grace, the unmerited favor of God, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You realize the only hope we've got in this life that's a real lasting hope is Jesus Christ. He says, and not only so, we glory in tribulation. Now that's what Romans chapter 5 says. We glory in tribulation. How many of you have ever read that before? How many of you have ever, ever quoted it before? How many of you love experiencing it? But this is what it says. We glory in tribulation also, knowing that... This is what we learn in our tribulation. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. How many of you realize we're an unpatient people? Y'all gave us a gift the other day to go on a vacation. We, we said as a family, talked about where we'd go on vacation. Gabriella is part of that family. We talked to her about it. She doesn't get to weigh in that much but because uh, she's only four years old. But we do tell her things. And we were telling her about uh, a place we were going to go. And she said, we said we were going to try to go to Alaska. We always wanted to go there. So we were going to go see Alaska. And she says, uh, oh, what are the things we can see in Alaska? So I said, well, let's find a video. And it shows what Alaska is. So we started looking at videos of whales and, and, uh, and, and big fish and beautiful trees and glaciers and bears. And she's like, oh, are we going to see bears? I said, yeah, they're going to be up close. I said, I hope not. I hope they're going to be a long ways away. <laughs> and then she started saying, when are we going to go? How many more sleeps until we get there? How many more <laughs> times are we going to go to bed before we get to go? She's been asking that every day. How many more sleeps? And we tell her, you have to be patient. Baby. You have to be patient. We're going to get there eventually. When Miss Hooker was here, I thought it was funny. We were praying for Miss Hooker, and she will pray. She doesn't pray for Miss Hooker. She plays for Captain Hook. I don't know how she got it that way, but she prays. And so she told Miss Hooker the other day, she said, we're going on vacation. Ms. Hooker said, where, where are you going? She said, Alaska. And she said, oh, great. And this is what she said. She said, I am so unpatient. That's what she said. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We are an impatient people. We want it, and we want it fast, and we want it right. You know what tribulation does? It worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, you know what it says? Experience works what? Hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. You know what he says? He says that as you grow in the troubles you go in, and as you learn to start trusting in God, patiently trusting God, you get more experience, and look, you get stronger in your hope. You know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, has God ever taken you through any difficult thing in your life? Say amen. Has, has God ever taken through anything difficult in your life? Say it again. Amen? Yeah. All right, so when you get to a difficulty, you've got to remember that same God is still on the throne. That same God is still taking care of your situations. That same God is still coming back for us one day. That same God is in charge. As God has gotten us through the last thing, when we go through the next thing, we keep looking towards our hope. Looking towards Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so, a couple of things he reminds himself. Even in the midst of saying some negative things, look at verse number 9. I will say unto God, what? My what? Rock. He considers him as rock, even though he's saying, why hast thou forgotten me? I, I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, there's two things in there. He's saying, why have you forgotten me? While he's also reminding him that he is still my rock. He is my stability. 
I'm going to go through some things, but I'm still anchored to the rock. You know, it sounds funny when you look at it. You're my rock, and I feel like you've forgotten me. You say, those things sounded polar opposite. No, here's a person that's saying, I feel forgotten, but I know that my anchor is still in the rock. Amen. You've got to do that. I'm saying, preach to yourself. My anchor is in the rock. He is my stability. Look at 43.1. I'm almost done. 43.1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust men. And when I read that one, not only is he my rock and my stability, but he is my satisfaction. Now let me say, you say, well, what do you mean satisfaction? Everybody I've ever dealt with in counseling and even in myself, and I want you to listen, I'm almost done. Everybody I've ever dealt with, you know what you want when you go through a difficulty? You may not say it, but you want validation and vindication. You know what people want? They want to tell you the story of how they've been injured, and they want somebody to say, you're right and they're wrong. They want that. They, they feel like they need that. Do you realize that that's what our court system is even set up as? Our court system is set up so that you stand here and the person that did you wrong stands over here. A judge makes sure that everybody is speaking the way they're supposed to speak. And then some of your peers stand over there and listen to the story. And at the end of it, they either say, you're valid and he's wrong or he's valid and you're wrong. Somebody will valid get validated in this and then they want vindication at the end. Somebody's going to say, this is what you got to pay back for what you've done. This is what we want in life. We want it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Not always in life do we get to see that and get to grab that. And when we don't see it, it's a different series that I'm preaching through, is we become bitter. Because we did not get to see the validation, and we didn't get any validation, and we didn't get to see the vindication. But let me say something to you, and I want you to grab a hold of this. This psalmist said something that you need to get. The Lord will judge. I don't feel very satisfied of what somebody has done to me. I may not ever see the satisfaction, but he'll take care of it. And I can be satisfied in knowing that he is the judge that will take care of all things. You didn't know all this was in there. He's my stability. He's my satisfaction. In verse number 2 of 43, he says this, For thou art the God of my what? You know what? When I'm weak, He is strong. He'll be my strength. You know, when you get to chapter 44, look, I make tons of notes. When you get to chapter 44, He starts off in verse 1, watch this. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work Thou didst in their day and the times of old. We've heard people talk about how great God is. How that says, drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. How that did af um, <coughs> afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not, watch now, they got not the land in possession by their own sword. You know what? Those people didn't get it because they were strong. Neither did their own arms save them. See, this is all connected on purpose. You know what he says? But thy right hand. I've always thought that reminds me of Jesus. You know where he's been seated? He's seated at the right hand, the throne of God. The right hand came down and took care of it for us. And so he says, it was my own arm that saved me, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. Now watch now. He says it was the countenance of God that showed favor. Look now, listen, you can get a hold of it, but it help you that when I'm in trouble, when I'm going through something and I have no strength in the midst of what I'm going through, I look to the countenance of God who is my help and the countenance of God looks down and shows favor on me in the midst of my trouble and he begins to take care of it for me when i don't have the strength he has the strength when i don't have the sword he is the sword he takes care of those things for us that's what he's saying and you look at verse number three of 43 watch what he says oh send out thy light and thy truth let them lead me you know what he said just a few minutes ago in verse number 7 of the one before it, I'm deep, calleth unto deep at the noise of thy 
water spouts, all thy waves and billows are gone over me. I'm in darkness. I don't know where to go. And I don't have any sight. So not only is he my stability and my satisfaction and my strength, he's my sight. What is it that gives him the sight, the light and the truth, that will bring me to the holy hill? This, think about this for a minute. It brings me to the holy hill and the tabernacles. Psalm 36, if you were to flip back just a couple of pages, Psalm 36 in verse number 9. <clears throat> David is doing a psalm that's very similar to this psalm. Watch what he says in verse number 9. For with thee is the foundation of light. Watch what he says. This is a very great statement. In thy light shall we see light. You know, if you put that together with deep calleth unto deep, and light leads you to light. You know what the psalmist, I wish you could get a hold of this. You know what the psalmist is saying? If we get to focusing on the deep, we're only going to go deeper. If you can get a reasonable perspective and you start looking at the light, it leads towards more light. If you can start preaching to yourself and start looking to the Word of God and let the Word of God, listen now, let the, he said, send me your Word and let it bring me to where I need to be. Send me the light and your truth and let it bring me to where I'm supposed to be. <clears throat> and then let me say lastly this, his rejoicing praise. And so what he does in verse number four, I've got it circled in my Bible, I've got it circled, and it says, then, then will I. Look, after all this, if you'll just do this, if I can get my mind focused on the fact that you are my stability, you are my strength, you're my satisfaction, you're all those things for me. If I can just get my mind there and you can send the light to give me some sight that I can start looking towards light that will bring more light into my life. If I can do that, then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy, yea, upon the harp will I praise Thee, O God my God." You realize when you get there, he said, I go to the altar. I don't think he was going to, the, you know, in the altars in the Old Testament is where they made sacrifices. Well, you say, well, I go to the altar so I can praise or pray. There it was an altar for sacrifice. And when you think about this, it wasn't going there to, to sacrifice for a sin. There was sacrifices you'd make for thanksgiving, for being thankful. You know, Hebrews says something a lot like that. Hebrews 13, 15 for the New Testament. It says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of Praise to God <clears throat> continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. You know what? If you can ever, watch now, if you can ever get a hold of this and you can start preaching this to yourself, here's the man with a problem. Here's the man that enters into prayer, a very real prayer. But in, in, even in the prayer, even in his problem, he has to interject with the right perspective. And when he does that, listen now, it causes him to begin to praise God. And he says, I will sacrifice thanksgiving to your name. How I many you think about that? In the midst, it didn't say his situation changed. Did it, did it say the situation changed? His circumstances did not change. But you know what did change? It says at the end, my countenance. The, the, the circumstances did not, but his countenance did. And he began there to offer thanks to God, and he began to sing on the harp, began to sing and play and sing praises to God. And how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, you have to preach to yourself in the midst of a difficulty. You've got to remember this sermon. You've got to remember these verses. And you've got to run back to them in the middle of the difficulty. You know, in Philippians 4, Paul said this same thing in Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? See, y'all know it. See, this is the problem. We know the verses. We have a hard time living them. Be careful, full of care for how many things? Amen. Nothing. By prayer and supplication with? You insert the right perspective there of being thankful to God in the midst of what you're going through. Did it say, wait a minute, wait till everything changes and then, no, 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 in the midst of it. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes on understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. He goes on and says this 
if there be anything that's true, anything that's holy, anything of good report, what does he say? Think on these things. I'm trying to help you folks. You know what you got to do? Paul even said you're going to have to... Paul wrote from prison about being joyful in Philippians. You know what he said? In the midst of everything you're going through, don't be full of care. Call out to Him. Pray to Him. You got a problem? Pray to Him. And try to put it in the right perspective. Think on these things. It'll cause you to rejoice. Circumstances don't change, but our countenance can. And when he, when he said, I look to the countenance of the one that helps me, it says it then becomes health to his countenance. You know, you might not change where you're at, but your face will change, your heart will change, your rejoicing will change if you can just get your focus on the right things or the wrong things. If you can get, somebody said it, the song said it, if we can get our focus when we're in the ship, and off of the waves and onto the one that walks on the waves, it'll fix a whole lot of issues. And so this is a message you've got to preach to yourself. Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> Listen, it's not about geography. It's about your heart. If you're not saved this morning, you never trusted Christ your Savior let me encourage you to, to get that settled this morning. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. It's not about I joined this church or I, I started doing this thing or I turned over a new leaf. No, there's no amount of leaves you can turn over that you get saved. It's you putting your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did when He died on the cross, was buried and rose again for your sins. That's salvation. But if you are saved today, you either in something, or you're, you either have gone through something, you're in something, or you're soon to go through something. And what you'll have to do is preach to yourself. Lord, we love you. We ask you to please help these people. Lord, I've tried to be true to your word and just preach your word. I pray that you'd now help them to apply it to their lives. Lord, do the work really that, that really only you can do. And Lord, we'll give you honor and praise for it. Touch people now in Jesus' name. Amen. She's going to play. Some are already praying. You can come to an altar and pray this morning.